Trouble at the Crossing Percy was chuffing along one morning, pulling some trucks. He was coming towards a level crossing where a car was waiting for him to pass. Percy was slowing down and he said hello to the man who opened and closed the gates of the level crossing. The man waved back cheerily. But the driver of the car stood up and shouted at Percy. Get a move on you silly engine! I can't wait her all day! He called and he shook his fist angrily. This rather surprised Percy. He was not used to people being so rude. He said nothing and hurried away down the line, leaving an angry man behind him. Percy arrived back at the yard, still looking upset. Gordon saw him and asked, What is the matter with you, little Percy? What has happened to that cheeky grim? Percy told Gordon what had happened. A nasty man in the car shouted at me to hurry up at the level crossing, so I did as fast as I could. Huh, said Gordon. Running away like that is no good at all. You really should have told him to mind his manners. I certainly would have done. Later that day, Gordon set off pulling his train. At the level crossing, he saw the man in the car on his way home, again waiting for the gates to open. Now I will see if he dares say anything to a fine engine like me, thought Gordon. As his driver shot off steam, Gordon glared at the car. Sure enough, the man stood up in his car and said, Get out of my way, you great big blue kettle! Gordon's driver was so surprised, he forgot to release the brake. Gordon stopped. Great big blue kettle, I will have you know that I am a fine engine, the fastest on this railway, he said. Well, you are not going very fast now, shouted the man, as Gordon's driver struggled to get steam up. How dare you talk to me like that, continued the man. I will have to speak to your controller. Gordon snorted. If you are in a hurry, you should travel by train he said grandly, as he moved off, leaving the car in a cloud of steam. Later that day, the fat controller told Gordon off. He had heard all about what had happened. You are a bad engine, he said. Never be rude to anybody, whatever they say to you. Edward heard about the fat controller telling Gordon off for being rude to the man in the car. Later, Percy told Edward all about the man at the railway crossing. Gordon was right to say you should not have run away, Percy, said Edward. But, I'm afraid I think your way was even worse, Gordon. You see, it is always best to be polite, especially to rude people. It calms them down so that things get better and not worse, said Edward. The next day, Edward was pulling a train towards the level crossing. He saw a car waiting and guessed it was the same one that Percy and Gordon had met. As Edward slowed down, he said, Good morning, to the man who operated the gates and to the car driver. The car driver stood up and started to shout. Not another stupid slow engine. Hurry along out of my way, will you? I am very sorry, said Edward. I only want to wish you a good morning. The car driver looked confused. He went rather red in the face. Oh, uh, very well then. Off you go. Goodbye, he said, and sat down, looking the other way. Edward pulled his train over the crossing. He was just getting up steam, when he heard the driver trying to start his car, but the motor would not work. Edward's driver shot steam for a moment and turned to see if the car would start, but it would not. He called out, Excuse me, but would you like a lift? Um, thank you very much. Er, yes, I would like a lift, said the driver. He went rather red again, and quickly climbed into one of Edward's coaches. Edward chuffed cheerfully down the line to the station.
At the station, the car driver said, I am sorry I was rude to you and the other engines. You have shown me that it is better to be polite. Well done, Edward, said the fat controller. You are a really friendly engine. Trouble on the tracks. Peep, whistled Thomas, as he saw the points ahead were set and the signal was set for go. I usually have to stop here for bigger engines, but not today. Steady, Thomas, said his driver. We still must be careful. We can only use the up train track here while the down train line is being repaired. Ahead, Thomas could see men hard at work trying to repair the down track. They'll be surprised to see me coming along so early, he thought. Thomas was ready to give a friendly whistle to the busy workmen, but before he could, Thomas saw something hurrying towards him on his track. It was Henry. The two engines were pulling their coaches towards each other on the same track. Look out! hissed Thomas. Look out! whistled Henry. Thomas's driver shot off steam at once and braked. Henry's driver did the same. Thomas's wheels locked tight, but thankfully, he stopped a foot away from Henry. You silly tank engine, Henry grumbled crossly. You're on my track. No, you're on my track, spluttered Thomas. The signal and the points gave me the right way. Both drivers soon joined the argument. Each blamed the other for the mistake. Back up and let me pass, Thomas fumed. No, you back up, huffed Henry. Just then, Edward chuffed slowly along the damaged down track. He was bringing more men to help repair it. Edward knew at once what had happened. The signal and the points were in Henry's favor, Edward began. But they're broken. My driver is fixing them now. See, Thomas, shouted Henry. So back up. I won't, I won't, protested Thomas. We won't, we won't, added Annie and Clarabelle. I'm not in the wrong, Thomas went on. My signal said go. But Thomas, said Edward reasonably, we need to find a solution, not argue who is right or wrong. Besides, the fat controller likes sensible engines, not stubborn ones. So Thomas was backed up to the broken signal. Henry hurried past, whistling rudely. Huh, puffed Thomas. That's the thanks you get for being sensible. Patience, Thomas, said Edward. And Edward was right. At the station, the fat controller was waiting to tell Thomas how pleased he was with his behavior. And Thomas beamed with pride. There was great excitement around the island. For the first time in history, man had set foot on the moon, leading the subject of space to captivate the railway. The engines found it very exciting. Just imagine being up there in space, they said. What a thing that would be. Murdoch, however, seemed rather uninterested in the subject. I don't quite see the appeal myself, he said. Whilst I imagine it's nice and quiet up there, space is hardly a place for an engine. <laughs> You're just boring, laughed Henry. Murdoch chuckled too. <laughs> you lot are more than welcome to it. I'll stay here and work whilst you fly away in your rockets. However, amid the rapid space chatter, quiet whispers began to echo around the yards among the trucks. But trucks are prone to spreading silly gossip, so nobody took any notice. It wasn't until the coaches began joining in the gossip that everyone started to listen. We've seen spaceships, they cried. <laughs> what a load of nonsense, Gordon snorted. Spaceships? Really, whatever next? Something has to be up, insisted James. I just know it. Hey, I could have sworn I clocked something strange the other night, added Donald quietly. Could it be my imagination, of course. 
but it also could have been aliens, quivered Bear. Gordon rolled his eyes. <sighs> this is the sort of nonsense I'd expect Thomas or Percy to spout, not sensible mainline engines. It's not nonsense, protested James. There's aliens about. Most of the engines were in agreement, except for Murdoch. It's just this silly little space craze, he whispered to Gordon. They'll move on soon. Just a bit of excitement is all. Hmm, well, I'm glad there's at least one engine who can see sense instead of stars, huffed Gordon as Murdoch puffed away to collect his next train. He found Duck arranging his trucks, but to his surprise, the poor engine looked very pale. Goodness me, worried Murdoch. You look as if you've seen a ghost. Duck sighed. Oh, no, not a ghost. I... Oh, never mind. You just think I'm silly. Not at all. I know you, Duck. You're one of the most sensible engines I know. Whatever's upset you must be important. Duck gave Murdoch a sad look before he gave a weary sigh. <sighs> it's these whispers of spaceships. I thought it was all silly rumours myself. Until last night, that is. He paused dramatically. I was helping tidy the yard last night, just after the night express left. As I was working, I suddenly saw these strange lights high in the sky. I'd hardly enough time to see them before they vanished out of thin air. I thought maybe it was Harold the helicopter, but Percy told me he'd been helping with the postal work, so it couldn't have been him. Besides, he'd never fly so recklessly as to just vanish. I'm sure I saw those lights, Murdoch. It couldn't have been a trick. The truck saw them too. It must have been a spaceship. Poor Murdoch didn't know what to think. He trusted Duck's judgment and could see how rattled the tank engine was. Although he didn't want to, Murdoch found himself beginning to believe the rumours too. For the next few days, the subject of alien spaceships remained the talk of the main line. Some remained sceptical, but most of the engines remained certain and they would speak in hushed whispers whenever they met at stations. Those who ran night services were especially paranoid. Bear became so nervous that Boko, who didn't believe the rumours, had to take over the midnight goods. One evening, a few weeks after the initial sightings, Boko didn't feel well. Bear was at the other end of the main line, so Murdoch found himself assigned to the midnight goods. Oh dear, he puffed to himself as he waited to depart. I hope we don't see anything strange tonight. Good luck, Murdoch! called Duck. Do stay safe and alert! Murdoch was too anxious to reply. As the guard whistle cut through the still air, the big engine puffed slowly and nervously away out of the yards and onto the main line beyond. The train started off well, but both Murdoch and his trucks felt uneasy. The night sky loomed over them, seemingly intimidating them from above. Come on, come on, puffed Murdoch to himself. I'd like to get this done quickly before anything strange happens. His thoughts were suddenly interrupted by the trucks. Oh, 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 look, look! Murdoch's eyes shot to the skies. Two lights shone high above the train before they suddenly vanished from sight. They had actually been obscured by a cloud, but neither Murdoch or his trucks realised this. Oh my, it's a spaceship! cried Murdoch as the trucks shouted and screamed behind him. They bumped about in panic. So roughly, there was a sudden crack! Murdoch's fireman looked back. Whoa, boy! Steady on! One of the van doors has come open! We've got to stop and secure it! Murdoch didn't want to stop, but he knew he had to. The driver applied the brakes and the train began to slow. Murdoch was relieved to see the junction up ahead. This will be a safe place to stop, he sighed 
as the train drew to a stop at the platform. Hello there! Murdoch jumped! In all the commotion, he had failed to spot Percy waiting at the platform of the mail train. Oh! You startled me! he said. <laughs> you do look spooked, chuckled Percy. Whatever is the matter? Murdoch stammered. Oh, well, you see, I had to stop. A, a van door came open. Trucks got a little rattled. Thought we saw a spaceship and... <laughs> a spaceship? laughed Percy. What makes you think you saw a spaceship? Perhaps it was me, called a voice, as there, out of the night sky, came Harold hovering down. Murdoch was surprised. Harold? What are you doing here? I've brought Percy's post, the helicopter smiled. I've not come to abduct anyone. <laughs> so, why are you worried about spaceships? teased Percy. Murdoch blushed brightly before he quickly explained about the mainline phenomenon. When he finished, Percy laughed, but Harold looked stern. Oh, botheration, he sighed. I knew this would happen. There's been a new plane at my airfield. Its owner likes to take it out for flights when it's dark, says they enjoy seeing all the towns at night. But the fellow is far too reckless of a pilot. But they've deep pockets, you see, chap so they can carry on as they please. That's why your lot must see strange lights that disappear so suddenly. When he finished, Murdoch found he could only laugh. Oh dear, he said. I think everyone's let the space age chat to get them all too far on edge, myself included. He added with a final chuckle, I'm sorry you two, but I really must get on with this train. Good night. And with a cheerful blast of his whistle, he puffed away into the night, this time without a worry in his smoke box. The next morning, he explained all about Harold and the new plane. The other engines were relieved, and in some cases, rather embarrassed. After that, the subject of space quickly faded away, and from then on, the engines were more cautious of rumours. But for quite some time afterwards, whenever Murdoch would see a plane in the sky, he would have a quiet chuckle to himself before blowing a cheerful whistle for any spaceships that might be nearby. Brendam Docks is one of the busiest harbours on the island of Sodor. Day or night, it is always bustling with activity as trains and ships come and go. The cranes are kept very busy, especially poor Cranky. Come on, come on, he barked. Get those trucks into place. How can I unload this ship if you don't give me anything to load? A please wouldn't go amiss, called Percy cheekily. Cranky's scowl grew sterner. Careful, Captain, Salty chimed in. You keep that skulling up and you won't be able to undo it. Pa, snored the crane indignantly. Percy thought it a great joke. You should try smiling more often. You never know. It may even cheer you up. Many a moon has it been since our cranky smiled, chuckled Salty. It's as if as he's forgotten how. What's the use in smiling when I have annoying little engines pestering me whilst I work? Came a blunt reply. Now why don't you two be sensible and get to work? He really could do it cheering up, whispered Percy. Although... I wonder what would cheer him up. Tis a mystery, matey, smiled Salty, as he scampered away to arrange some more trucks. By now, Percy's trucks were loaded, and the little green engine puffed away too, still pondering about Cranky. He was still deep in thought the next morning, as he ambled along to the docks with a train of stone. There must be some way to cheer him up, he puffed. But as they neared a station, his thoughts were cut short, Ahead was a red signal. I wonder what's the matter, thought Percy. As they neared the platform, he saw the station master waiting for them. There's a cow blocking the line. Farmer call has been called, but you'll have to wait until the line's clear. Oh, bother, grumbled Percy. If I'm late, 
Cranky's sure to give me a mouthful. He gave an impatient peep peep of his whistle. As if on cue, the signal suddenly dropped, showing the line clear. Hooray! cheered Percy. We won't be late after all. He scurried away at once, but in the commotion, no one seemed to notice someone slipping into the guard's van. Percy arrived at the docks right on time. The little engine felt very relieved as he came to a stop besides Cranky. He was just about to call up to the crane when Salty cried out in surprise. Well, sure me timbers. I didn't know you were bringing a visitor, matey. Percy was surprised. What do you mean visitor? It was then his guard came walking up, holding in her arms Sierra, the station cat. Goodness me, what's she doing here? cried Percy. She must have climbed aboard my van when we stopped at Maithwaite, the guard explained. Well, I never, said Percy in surprise. Oh, we best get her home quickly. It's far too noisy for her here. But Sierra hardly seemed to notice the bustling harbor. Her eyes were locked onto something. Look, laughed Salty. She's looking up at your hook, Cranky. Everyone looked, and sure enough, Sierra was watching intently as Cranky's hook swung around as he worked. She was fascinated by the crane. You've got yourself a fan, Cranky, laughed the engines. Cranky was quite taken aback. He didn't know what to say. Oh, well, um, just keep that little pest out of my way, he stammered as he quickly turned away. He couldn't contain a small smile and he hoped the engines hadn't seen it. They had, though, and they exchanged knowing winks. Percy's return train was quickly arranged. The guards sat keeping Sierra safe as they waited. The cat's eyes remained fixed on Cranky's hook throughout. Percy whistled cheerfully as he left. For him and for Sierra, Cranky watched the train until it was out of sight. Sierra never came back to Brendam Docks, but her trip wasn't soon forgotten. Every now and again, whenever Percy was around, Cranky would ask after her. I'm just making sure that little bug doesn't return, he said sternly. Docks are no place for a cat. To this day, Cranky insists that he doesn't care for Sierra, but unfortunately for him, Percy and Salty know better. Pip and Emma had been purchased by the Fat Controller to run the Railways Express service to London. The diesels were honoured and quickly proved their worth. The engines, however, were nervous. Gordon had always been the Premier Express engine, but with the arrival of the high-speed train, Gordon was finally retired from the Express. The engines worried Gordon would be resentful, but the big engine stepped down with grace and joined the others in warmly welcoming Pip and Emma to the family. Gordon, after being given a short, well-earned rest, began work pulling local trains. After so many years of hurrying about, he enjoyed the gentler pace. But although he projected an image of content, deep down he still felt a little disheartened. One evening, he found himself alone in the sheds. Alone with his thoughts, he didn't notice Edward shuffle in. Hello, Gordon, Edward called. The big engine jumped. Edward! I didn't see you come in. Edward smiled. I apologize if I startled you. You seemed rather forlorn. Is everything all right? Yes, yes, everything is fine, little Edward, said Gordon as loftily as he could. Edward gave a reassuring smile. I've known you a long time, Gordon, so I can tell if something is up. If you don't wish to share it, that's fine. Oh, you're right, Edward, admitted Gordon. There's been a small something on my mind. It's just the express, you see, he said, after a pause. It's not that I'm jealous or that I'm unhappy with Pip and Emma. I think they're doing a fine job, better than I can at this old age. But it's just... I just wish I could have one last run with it, you know? My last run was quite sudden. It would be nice to have had a proper send-off. I know what you mean, comforted Edward. I'm sorry you feel that way. Never mind, muttered Gordon. It'll pass, I'm sure. With that, he retired to sleep, leaving Edward to ponder the situation. What neither engine had noticed was the quiet arrival of Pip and Emma. 
Oh, botheration, flounced Pip. I've never had luck with this silly cooling system. It was the next morning. Most of the engines had set off for work, but Pip wasn't feeling well. Whatever shall we do? cried Pip as dramatically as she could. I'll never be able to work alone, cut in Emma woefully. I wasn't feeling quite right yesterday, so I don't know if I'll be able to manage. Whatever are we to do? sighed Pip. The inspectors scratched their heads. The faults with the diesels couldn't have come at a worse time. We've got to do something, one muttered. The express is due out soon. We'll never make it, moaned Emma. You have to get someone else. But who? replied the inspector. Oh, oh, why not Gordon? said Emma innocently. Gordon was still on shed. His first train was due out for a while yet. The inspector hurried over to him. Gordon, do you think you could step in? We might be able to restore the old system just until we've a proper stand-in ready. Gordon was surprised, but excited. I can certainly try, sir. And so the arrangements were swiftly made, and Gordon was hastily readied for the express. He was very excited and wanted to go to the station straight away. When at last he backed onto the train, he found the fat controller waiting for him. Thank you, Gordon, he said. You've saved us from an awkward predicament. You just need to get to the train to the end of the line, just as you always have. A high-speed train will take over from there. The passengers know they'll be delayed, so don't worry about being behind time. Don't worry, sir. I'll get them there early. Chortled Gordon. Just you wait and see. The fat controller smiled and tipped his hat just as the guard's whistle blew. Gordon responded with gusto. Whistle blasting, wheels spinning, and the engine snorting. The express swiftly drew out of the station. Come along, come along, come along! Called Gordon excitedly from the front. Trickety trot, trickety trot, sang the coaches from behind. With one last youthful cry of "Hurry, hurry, hurry!" Gordon and the express rattled around the corner and out of sight. The fat controller watched until the train had long disappeared from view. By a fortunate stroke of luck, not long after Gordon had left the station, Pip and Emma found themselves feeling quite healthy once again. The Diesels felt rather pleased with themselves, but they had forgotten about the fat controller. I am quite aware what transpired this morning, and I do not approve of my engines feigning illness," he said to them. However, Edward has told me why you may have played such a game. Because of this, I am willing to turn a blind eye just this once. So long as we have a firm understanding that this sort of thing is to never be repeated, the Diesels agreed wholeheartedly. Yes, sir. We are sorry, sir. Thank you, sir. They were waiting for their next train when Gordon trundled into sight. He felt worn out, but he couldn't look happier. Hello, Gordon," smiled Emma, who was at the front. "Thank you for filling in for us. Did you have a good run?" "Yes, indeed," beamed Gordon. It truly felt like a proper send-off. I couldn't have asked for a better run. Excellent," smiled Pip. "We're glad you enjoyed yourself." "Thank you, you two," Gordon added quietly with a wink. "I'm not as naive as you may think. I appreciate the gesture, not to mention your service. I feel quite worn out after all that. I just don't have the energy anymore, so it's all the better you're here instead." The three engines laughed happily. Glad that the torch had finally been passed with style and grace.